Amen. Through everything that's been going on lately, I have been reminded over and over and over again that God is still good. I've been reminded of this personally and here at the church that the goodness of God is not predicated on the seasons of life that we go through. And aren't you so thankful for that? Because you know, we're guaranteed in life that we're going to have really great times. That there are going to be some amazing days in this life. And we're also guaranteed that life is going to happen. And there are going to be some days that we wish that we had never gotten out of bed. There are going to be some days that we look back on and we think, man, I wish I could have skipped over that one. I wish I could have missed out on all the heartache that that day brought. But whether it's a good season, a good day, a bad season or a bad day, the goodness of God remains constant through every season of life. We just came out of this long series on the book of Philippians where we talked about the joy of God and how the joy of Jesus was not something that the world could take away from us because it wasn't something that the world had given us. And that's true of so many different things as believers. It's true of our joy. It's true of our identity. When your identity is rooted and placed in who you are in Christ, then there is nothing that the world can say. There is nothing that the world can do to take your identity away. We hear about people going through midlife crisis. Well, what that is, it's, it's an identity crisis. You get to this certain point in your life and you're still trying to figure out who you are and where you fall in this grand scheme of the world and what your life actually means. It's an identity crisis that can actually be avoided if you're just rooted in who you are in Christ. If you get your identity from Christ, then nothing around you can take your identity away. You can lose your job, still have your same identity, right? You can go through any season of life, and your identity can remain constant. Why? Because your identity doesn't come from the things that this world gives. Provision is the same way. Our provision, as believers, we understand it comes from God. The job thing carries through. You can lose your job, and you can still have peace, and you can still have joy, and you can still know whose you are, and you can still know that God is going to take care of your needs because the Word says that He will. Our provision comes from God. And our hope, our hope does not come from the world, and it cannot be taken by circumstances or people in the world. We have so many answers as believers right now. We have so many answers to the questions that the world is asking. And one of those is that we have the key to hope in a world that feels hopeless. We have hope in a world, in a society, specifically right now in the U.S., in a society that feels hopeless, we have the key to hope. The problem for the church is that we've gotten so entrenched in our own ideas and fears and political views and what we think is right and what we think is wrong. We've gotten so dug in that we've forgotten that we have the answers that the world needs. But we're not giving those things out as we should be. Instead, I'm more interested in making sure that you know my opinion on everything that's going on. I'm probably going to make some of you guys mad this morning. So just brace yourself for it. And after church, I'm still, we can't hug anymore, but I'm still going to love you. And you're still going to love me, and it's going to be okay. But we're just going to be real and look at the Word of God this morning. We have a reason for hope. That's what we're going to look to today in the Word of God. This morning we're going to talk about the reason for hope. This morning we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter number 3, but before we read the text as you're turning there, I want to give you a little background on the letter that the Apostle Peter is writing. He's writing to both Jews and Gentiles who have been scattered across Asia Minor. This letter is written in 64 AD, so the church is 31 years old. For a little bit over three decades, the New Testament church has been in existence when Peter writes this letter. 
He's writing to a church that is facing extremely heavy persecution from the state. Nero was the Roman emperor, and he hated Christians. He was actually known to cover Christians in skins of wild animals and throw them to the lions to be eaten and throw them to wild dogs to be eaten. And he would throw them out in front of people to see Christians eaten alive. When I say that Nero hated Christians, I mean that he hated them and he wanted to kill all of them. He was an awful man, an awful leader who actually persecuted the church. So when we talk about persecution in the early church, we're talking about real persecution. We're not talking about made up western world if you don't do exactly what I say and if you don't think exactly how I think, then you are persecuting me and you must be working for the antichrist. I told you we're just going to make everybody mad today. I do believe that we could be headed toward a time when the church will actually be persecuted for our faith. And if I'm being honest, it absolutely terrifies me. Not that I'll be persecuted, even though that thought on its own isn't a pleasant one. I don't think this is a new strategy by the enemy. We've been slowly working our way to the place of persecution for decades. And I'm a little worried for the church when people are talking about wearing a mask and the loss of coins being one step away from the Antichrist and the end times because what's going to happen when the consequence to coming to church isn't that you have to wear a mask, but the consequence is if you go and you're found out and you proclaim Jesus Christ, that you will die. It's real quiet already. There are places in the world that we live right now that are like that today. We act like this is something new. We feel like we're so special in the United States. Like the heavens rise and fall on what's happening to us in this moment. Don't you understand that there are places all over the world that if you proclaim that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, they would kill you on the spot. And you know what? People in those countries and in those places are still following Jesus. But I don't want to be convenienced, inconvenienced in any way, or I'm just going to stay home for a little bit. I'm certainly not here to talk about masks this morning. Lord knows that I'm done with that conversation. Whether they're good or whether they're bad, but the idea that I won't go to church if I have to wear a mask is terrifying to me because one day the consequence of going to church isn't going to be wear a mask and stay six feet apart. It's going to be imprisonment and death. And so if we're struggling with a put a mask on and be mildly inconvenient for an hour to gather together with believers, what in the world is the church going to do when the state comes in and says, hey, if you go and proclaim Jesus, we're going to throw you in jail and we're going to kill your family. So persecution for the church absolutely terrifies me. What that will look like if and when it actually comes. Anyway, Paul's writing a letter to the church that is under actual persecution. And he's talking to this church about hope. Hope. Of all things, if, if I'm your pastor, sorry I said Paul, this is Peter. We did, you know, all Philippians on Paul. I've been saying Paul for a long time. I'll probably do it two or three more times today. Just know Peter wrote the letter. What Peter is saying to the church is not what you would want to hear from your pastor. The state is killing Christians. What we would want to hear is how are we going to fight back? How are we all going to band together and fight against the state and preserve our rights as believers? And that's not what Paul is saying, Peter. <laughs> 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 
That's not, that's number one. That's not what Peter is saying. What is he saying? He's saying, when they come to kill you, keep living with hope. 1 Peter 3, 8-15. through 15. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. I lost most of y'all right there. If, if I get up and preach that, just everybody's leaving. Repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Verse 10. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We've got the hope. We have the reason for hope. And Peter says that we have to be ready to give that reason to a world that's falling down around us and our Christian neighbors are being killed. And he's, he's saying we still have to live a life that is worthy of the gospel and that is filled with hope. So how can you have hope in a hopeless situation? As we break down the text Today, I want to remind you that the primary purpose for the Bible in our lives is as a mirror and not a window. Okay, some of y'all didn't get that, so we're going to talk about it for a second. The Word of God, whenever you read it, the primary purpose for the Word of God in your life is as a mirror. I read this and I see, does my life mirror, does my life reflect what I see in the Word of God? Not a window. And there is this rash right now of believers who are using the Word of God as a window through which to see everyone and everything around, but they're not first using it as a mirror. Do you understand the difference? I want you to use the Bible as a window to see the world. I want you to have a biblical worldview, but that will naturally happen when you use the Bible first as a mirror to your life. There's this thing happening where people are trying to impose the Bible onto the government and onto the schools and onto their friends and onto their relatives and onto society before they first impose the Bible onto themselves. So as we break down the scripture today, I want to ask you to fight the urge to think of what we're going to talk about as a prescription for everyone else's sickness and instead try to see it as a fix to what afflicts you. This is hard. You ever, you ever been in one of those messages, one of those sermons, and you left, and before you even hit the car, you look over at your husband or you look over at your wife and you go, I wish that so-and-so would have been here today because that word was for them. <laughs> they needed to hear that because, man, they got that all messed up. That's what happens naturally. Okay? What I'm going to ask you to do today is to fight that natural tendency toward seeing this and viewing other people through this and actually look at everything that we're going to talk about in Scripture today as a mirror and say, how am I doing at this? How am I handling this right now in the situation that we're living in? I want to break the Scripture day to down today down into three different sections. Section one is verses number eight and nine. It's instructions on how to live that end in a promise of blessing. 
So Peter's giving instructions here on how to live five really common sense ways, traits for us as believers, and then it ends with a blessing. Verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So there's five instructions to the believer. Let's talk about them very quickly. Number one is be like-minded. So we're holding up this mirror. So I want you to ask yourself, am I being like-minded? Am I being like-minded with other believers? Am I doing everything that I can do to be like-minded with people who are not believers? Find common ground and do what you can do to live in peace and unity. That's our biblical mandate as believers is to do everything that we can do to make absolutely every effort that we can make to live in unity with everyone. Not just people who think like us, not just people who come to our church, not just people who vote like us, not just people who live in the same neighborhood as we do, not just people who look like us. We're supposed to make every effort to live in unity with everyone. So far as it is under your control, you should try to be like-minded and live in unity and in harmony with everyone. If you go break that word down in the Greek, part of the definition is harmony. And I was thinking about that and how beautiful a picture that is because I like music. And so if you understand music and you understand harmony, what you get with harmony is you get different notes See, unity does not equal uniformity. Are y'all here? Okay. Unity does not mean we are exactly alike. See, the word is harmony. Different notes that all come together and make a beautiful sound. See, if, if our worship team just came up here and they all sang the exact same notes... Well, we could still worship the Lord, but it wouldn't sound as good. See, they each have individual parts that create harmonies, different, but together. What if we lived our life like that? We're holding up the Bible as a mirror. Are we living like-minded? As far as it is under our control. Am I going to be able to be like-minded with everyone? No, don't even want to be like-minded with some people but as far as it is under my control as I am a follower of Jesus I'm going to do everything that I can to live in harmony different but working together okay that's number one number two be sympathetic this one is one I'll tell you I personally struggle with this maybe that disappoints you as you know someone who should probably be sympathetic Danica's shaking her head yes on the front row. I'm actually avoiding eye contact with her on purpose right now. Because if you ask Danica after service, if you could change one thing about your husband, I would almost guarantee you that in the top three, I don't know, there's a lot, it's a big list. <laughs> but she would tell you that one thing, one opportunity for growth for me is that I'm not very sympathetic. Not a very sympathetic person. So I'm holding the Bible up as the mirror for my life, and it says to be sympathetic. This is sorrow for someone else's misfortune. And man, are we missing that in our culture today. Everybody's looking out for number one. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to get mine. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to take care of me. And if you don't make it, tough. I'm going to get all that I can get. I'm going to look out for me, and you look out for you. I'm going to do me, and you go and do you. It's not really a biblical concept. Sorrow for someone else's misfortune. And the third thing is to love one another. Love here is phylos. It comes from phileo. So a lot of times when we talk about love in the New Testament talk about agape love which is the love of God it's you know perfect love uh, but that's not the word that was used for love here 
This, these are really practical steps. These are things that, you know, we can do. This is brotherly love, phileo love. Just love one another in a, in a brotherly way, love each other. So we're holding the Bible up. Actually ask yourself, am I loving people well? Again, everybody. Not just the people who think like me. Right? Everybody. Am I loving people well? Be compassionate. That's number four. This one literally translates to being tender hearted. Number five is be humble. Don't always think that you have all of the answers. It's a dangerous place to be when we feel like that when we get so dug in, so dogmatic that every that our beliefs are absolute and there's absolutely no way that any belief that we carry in our life is possibly wrong. That's a dangerous spiritual place for us to be. So are we like-minded? Sympathetic, do we love one another, are we compassionate, or are we humble? Each of these five are internal decisions, but they will all always lead to external evidence. These things are planted on the inside of us, but they're always going to come out. If you're, if you're striving to live in unity, that's a decision that you make on the inside. But people are always going to know. It's, it's always going to eventually come out. Sympathetic, a decision I make on the inside, but you can see it on the outside. Love one another, a decision that I make on the inside, but you can tell by the fruit of my life if I actually love people or not. Compassionate. See, if you're compassionate, it will drive you to action. So if there's inaction and apathy, all around your life and you don't care about what other people are going through compassion is a decision that you make on the inside but it absolutely shows itself evident on the outside be humble that one's easy to spot it's a decision that we make internally but it will always come out externally so how do we live out verse number nine do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult on the contrary repay evil with blessing okay so every now and then I wish that there were these verses in the Bible that I could just like take a magic marker and draw through and it would just be gone this is one of those you are looking at me so holy he would defile the word of God in that way. I'm just being real. When somebody does something mean to me, I want to be mean to them. When somebody says something bad about me, see what I do for to take care of my family and to provide for my family, a large part of what I do is stand up in front of people and talk. Well, you do that for long enough, you get pretty good at talking. You get pretty good at reading people and knowing when you got them and when you don't got them. It would be so easy for me if I felt attacked by you to go to people in the church who I know I've got. So easy. I talk for a living. To go to them and be like, hey, you know this person over here? I could have a whole church mad at you by the end of the week. <laughs> Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. If you insult me, my natural response is going to be I'm going to insult you back. On the contrary. Okay, now, if it's going to say don't be mean to people who are mean to you, we could just leave it there. But Peter doesn't leave it there. He says, on the contrary, not only can you not be mean to people who are mean to you, not only can you not say bad things to people who say bad things about you, you've got to bless them. What? <laughs> I don't want to do that. In fact, I can't do that. 
on my own. I can't, Ryan can't get to that place. I may could muster up sometime the courage to not repay evil with evil, to not insult someone who insults me, but I cannot on my own muster up the courage to bless them as they walk away from cursing me. So how do we do that then? How do we do that? Well, we live out verse number eight. The only way that you're going to find yourself in a position in life where you do not repay evil for evil and insult with insult is if you are living a life that strives to live in harmony and unity, to be sympathetic. See, if you're sympathetic, then when somebody comes against you, then in, in sympathy rises up in you. You can say to yourself, you know, I don't know what they're going through right now. They may be having a bad day. That's something that I struggle with. <clears throat> love one another. If you really want to love people with brotherly love, then when they come against you, I still choose to love you. I still choose to pray for you. I still choose to bless you. Be compassionate and be humble. This is how we live out the beginning of verse number nine, to not repay evil with evil, insult with insult, but repay evil with a blessing. We can actually see the full list of verses 8 and 9 modeled for us in the life of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, this should be important to us. The five instructions to believers were all lived out by Jesus. There were people who did unthinkable things to Jesus, who said unthinkable things about Jesus. And do you know what he did? He still blessed them. He still died for them. He's hanging on the cross in his final hours of life after being tormented like we can't possibly imagine. And his prayer in Luke 23, 34, while he's hanging on the cross, is, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. My God. We get mad at people because they didn't wave at us whenever we saw them in Walmart. Jesus has his arms spread after being beaten and stripped naked and tormented for hours and hours and hours. And while, literally, while they're dividing his clothes up among themselves, he says, Father, forgive those men. That's love. That's compassion. That's humility. That's sympathy. That's wanting to live in harmony with people. The life of Jesus lived out. We've got to go on to section number two. I'm going to run out of time. Section number two illustrates what we talked about in section number one, but it does it with a psalm. So it's almost like Peter, as he's writing this letter, is preaching a sermon and what we like to do when we're preaching sermons is we like to give illustrations and so Peter's illustration in this particular letter was to go back to a psalm of David to illustrate what he had just talked about so section number one instructions on how to live and then we get a promise a blessing at the end oh actually we got we got to go back to that it's very important Jesus was blessed at the end of his life Right? Exalted to the right hand of the Father. Well, we don't just live out verses 8 and 9 for no reason. We live them out because that is how we inherit a blessing. So we're giving what we want to receive. It's a spiritual principle. You give what you want to get. You're feeling low on love? Give love. It'll come back. Okay? Feeling low on joy? Give joy. It'll come back. So even when they don't deserve to be blessed, you bless them anyway, because the blessing is what's going to come back. So Jesus blessed people who were in the midst of killing him. And what did he get? What did he inherit? He inherited a blessing. That's important. Okay, so he talks about that. 
right? These are the five ways that we're going to live. This is why we're going to do it. This is what you're going to get. Then he illustrates that point with a psalm of David. In verses number 10, 11, and 12 is from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. If I had like another hour, we could talk about that verse, but we don't have the time. Man, that's so hard to do. You want to love life? Then grab a hold of that thing that flops around in your tongue whenever it's say, in your mouth whenever it's saying things that it shouldn't be saying. Man, isn't that hard, though? Okay, not for you guys. Great. It's awesome. Keep your lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We're not going to spend a lot of time in this section, but there are a couple things to note here. One, there's a difference between seeking peace and pursuing peace, and we're called to do both. When you seek something, you look for it. Well, we're, we all want to look for peace. Where can we find peace? Where is peace out there? Right? There's a difference between looking for peace, seeking peace, and pursuing it. Seeking peace is just looking around for it. Pursuing it is chasing it down. I'm going to go with everything that I have, with, with all of my energy, with all of my emotions spiritually, I am going to chase down peace. There's a difference, and we're called to do both. And the easy way is just to look around for peace. Well, you're never going to find it. Ever. If you just want to stand in one place and be like, where is the peace? Hope the peace wanders upon me today. It's never going to happen. you got to pursue peace peace seek it and pursue it the second thing from this text and then we're going to move on to section number three if you want god to be attentive to your prayer then you have to be following him and again we could chase this rabbit way down the hole but the scripture is very clear the eyes of the lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers but the face of God turns away from people who are doing evil. We talked about this last week. I have privileges as a son. If you're a woman and you're a follower of Jesus, you have privileges as a daughter of God. And one of those is that when you call on the name of the Lord, he is attentive to your prayer. This is a special privilege of being a part of the family of God that people who are not a part of the family of God do not enjoy. That sounds harsh, Pastor. You're saying that if people aren't pursuing relationship with Jesus, that God is not attentive to their prayers? Yes. Well, that sounds kind of mean. Well, it's what the Bible says. You can read it again. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attended to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil his face turns from them when they call on his name I want God to be attentive to my prayer when I call on the name of the God on the name of God I want to get his attention I can be in a room of a thousand little kids, all of them screaming dad, and I can ignore all of them. But if one of my sons, in the midst of the thousands, I guarantee you, if one of my sons says dad, he has my attention. My face is toward him. I'm in tune with him. Why? Because he's my son, and when he calls out to dad, dad's going to look at him. I want God to be attentive to my prayer. That means that I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to do everything that I can do within my power to make sure that my life is in line with the word of God. We've got to go on. Section number three. 
This puts the blessing of God in perspective. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We're going to catch that last part first. Then we're going to go back and get the rest of it. Do this with gentleness and respect. Always be ready to give a reason. But do it gently. And with respect. Why? Because you can say the right thing in the wrong way, and nobody's gonna hear it. You don't believe me? Hop on Facebook today. You can say the right thing, but you can use the wrong tone, you can have the wrong attitude, you can use the wrong medium. And it's going to get tuned out. Just more noise in the background. Peter, oh, I've got it right that time. Peter understood that. And so he said, be ready to give a reason. Be ready to stand for what you believe. Stand firm in what you believe. Stand firm in your convictions. Be ready to give a reason. But do it gently and do it with respect. Okay. Section three, we're putting the blessing of God into perspective. In here, in verse number 14, he says, Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. Well, do you remember what the threats were of? Do like this, if you remember. Somebody. Okay. Death. And he says, Do not fear their threats. Do not fear their threats of death. Do not be frightened when they say that they are going to come and kill you for your faith. How can that possibly happen? You can only fear losing something when that loss is greater than what you will gain. In our walk with Christ, the greatest thing that anyone can take from us is our life. In this world, the greatest thing that anyone can take from us is our life. And that is exactly what was happening to the people who Peter was writing this letter to. But to lose your life, everybody focus, we're okay. To lose your life is to inherit that final eternal blessing. Are you with me? Everybody focus for just a second. The worst thing that's going to happen to you here in this world. Hey, will you help him? The worst thing that's going to happen to you here in this world. All right, everybody else here, we're good. Everybody's fine. The worst possible thing that's going to happen is you die. Are you with me? The worst thing that somebody can do to you because you're a believer in Jesus Christ is kill you. But when that happens, do you know what? We win. This is the blessing. This is the perspective of eternal blessing from God. The worst thing they can do is take your life from you. But to lose my life here on this earth, I understand as a believer, means that I immediately come into the presence of God forever. The worst thing that they can do to me gives me my ultimate victory as a believer. That's the reason for hope. He says, always be ready at all times to tell people who are living in a hopeless world, who are living in a hopeless situation, but they look at you and you've still got hope and you've still got joy and you've still got love because when you're living with hope in a hopeless world, people are going to recognize it. People are going to notice it. And when they do and they come to you and they say, how do you still have hope when your neighbors are being killed because of their faith? Then you can look to them and give them the reason because my hope is not in this world. 
Because I serve Jesus Christ who came from heaven as the Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He took my place on the cross. He died and then he was resurrected. And in that resurrection, I can now have eternal life. That's my reason for hope. Now, we're going to say it with gentleness, not like I just did. <laughs> we're going to say it gently. But that is our reason for hope. Man, don't we have a reason for hope? In a world that is starving for hope and love and joy and peace. We've got it. Let's not be distracted by the nonsense stuff. What I mean by that is if it doesn't concern eternity, let's put it on a shelf somewhere. Let's put it all aside. Because the church is uniquely positioned right now to give hope to people who are searching for hope. And we've got it. We've got it. My challenge to you this morning is really simple. Bring hope to a world that is in desperate need. Putting everything else aside. While the world may seem that it's burning down around us, we're still living the right way. How do we know if we're living the right way? Well, we just talked about five really easy ways that you can know. Just throughout the day, just stop. Tomorrow, set an alarm for some random time on your phone and just stop and say, today, have I been living in harmony with people? Have I been loving people well? Am I expressing, am I expressing sympathy and compassion? Have I been humble today? That's how we can know if we're living the right way in the blessing of God and filled with eternal hope. Will you stand with me this morning? Lord, you're just so good.